So we're going to talk about some principles of ecological garden design. Um, give you guys the basic tools um, for conducting your community-led design and going into your home sites and thinking about what could be uh, manifested there. So, uh, why am I including this? Um, it's kind of funny because the industry composters are like, you don't need to talk about soil science, you don't need to talk about gardening, you just need to talk about waste management, compost processing, but it's part of a bigger system, part of a bigger picture, and so that's why we wanted to present uh, a more comprehensive and holistic program here for you guys. Um, so not all composters are gardeners, um, but compost is used primarily on gardens to improve soil health and plant growth and to grow food um, and has a role to play in a regenerative food system. And so we want to integrate composting into our garden design to support all of those efforts. And so if we can understand kind of the overarching principles and approaches to ecological garden design, um, that can also support our composting efforts as well. Um, some of the same principles for kind of suppressing pests and pathogens by promoting biodiversity also helps us to suppress pests and pathogens around the compost pile. So uh, the principle of diversity around the garden also supports our composting process. So we're going to talk about kind of the perspectives and goals toward this process, um, the various design elements, kind of site modifications and infrastructure to think about. Uh, you know, when you come into a vacant lot, um, sometimes there's a water hookup, uh, sometimes there's not, so you may have to install those things. Um, is there power um, on site? Is there any infrastructure already there? If it's completely empty, um, then you're going to have to introduce those elements. Um, kind of the existing plant life and vegetation. There's existing trees um, that offer shade. You can kind of design around that um, and utilize the existing shade and trees and plant life that's already there. Thinking about these different kind of soil, water, sun needs that different types of plants and plant communities need and designing for that. Um, we'll introduce some planting concepts. Think about like what kind of irrigation uh, techniques you might want to use different soil building techniques that can be utilized in your space uh, and different structures that you might need to uh, have a good experience at your garden. So we need structures for our tools. Uh, we may want to have gathering spaces. Um, maybe we want to have a water feature such as a pond um, or like a drinking fountain potentially. Um, maybe we want uh, shade structures for people to hang out. Maybe we want an office space to kind of do our administrative work and planning. Our goals for ecological garden design um, are to restore healthy ecosystem functioning, and that includes soil health, restoring and cultivating biodiversity in general, um, both below ground and above ground cultivating and growing wildlife habitat um, for insects, birds, uh, other critters, small mammals. Um, one of the principles here is that, you know, if, if a bird is like eating your fruit, and this is maybe inevitable, but kind of cultivating, like growing a tree, like an elderberry tree, knowing that you're going to harvest some of it, and that some of it is also going to go to the wildlife. And we want to support that because we want to support um, a holistic ecology and that the birds have a role to play uh, in helping us, you know, eat up insects or pests and things like that. Um, and so we're sharing the space with the wildlife. And so we're integrating the wildlife into our design as well. Pest management and balance, both of those principles of biodiversity and wildlife habitat. And that um, those things also support a productive harvest. Uh, many, uh, uh, in, you know, our pollinators. There's many diverse pollinators, not just uh, honeybees, but we have many, many, many species of native pollinators, native bees, uh, and wasps as well. Uh, in addition to hummingbirds um, and other pollinators. Uh, 
So we want to create support for our pollinators, and that will help us to have a more productive harvest as well. Uh, carbon sequestration uh, happens not just with soil management, but also with the plant ecology that's happening above ground. So our practices above ground can support um, carbon sequestration in the soil as well. And of course, uh, to facilitate and support community connection and well-being and resiliency and the transformation of social systems. So I liked the perspective of agroecology. Um, it's kind of a agricultural production system based on nature. And so the idea that we're designing our agricultural systems mimicking native ecosystems. Um, and so thinking about um, all of those principles I just mentioned um, are kind of integrated into this concept. But it's more than just a design approach or an agricultural system. It's also, as I was mentioning earlier, that ecology is integrating kind of our human, social, and cultural dimensions as well. Um, kind of new definitions of agroecology kind of broaden it to include that, to talk about it as an ecology of food systems. So it's not just uh, the practice or the science or the method, but it's also the economic and social dimensions. And so it's also thinking about food access um, and equity and food justice and food sovereignty and those kinds of issues. Um, because many of the, the because the movement for community gardening and urbanized food production um, is well intentioned and it you know does produce some food for the community, um, but it's also been seen as an organizing tool for community empowerment and to build a more political power uh, from the community. Um, so these are you know complex spaces, and uh, we're contributing to both uh, to cultural and political issues as well. Um, so yeah, we are valuing, restoring, and empowering marginalized people um, and lands, and looking to kind of integrate marginalized communities and provide access to lands and allow them to be able to practice their food production methods uh, from their traditional cultures. So it's also about access and justice and political economy and making that food accessible uh, to all people. This is a really interesting kind of study that looked at the cooperative management practices of a coffee agroforestry farm, um, a couple of them in, I believe it was Nicaragua, and that impact on soil health. So there were two different kind of coffee cooperatives. One cooperative was more focused on commercial production and um, business kind of sales and success, and so more of an economic focus. And then the other cooperative was more small scale kind of family farmers. And they were more focused on kind of the ecological um, stewardship of the land. And so they looked at these two, they were both cooperative, so they were cooperatively managed, um, but with a slightly different focus. And so they looked at what the impact was from those management practices on soil health. And both of them had similar levels of carbon sequestration and organic matter in the soil. But the one that was more focused on the ecological aspect of the of the agroforestry um, operation um, and had more diverse plant life uh, above ground, um, showed uh, higher levels of nutrient storage and important nutrients in the soil. And that was one of the main kind of differences um, was kind of this greater soil fertility uh, provided by the cooperative management and greater biodiversity. The conventional kind of community garden model is that everybody gets their individual plot and they get to do their own thing and it gives them access to space to garden and grow food for themselves and uh, support their um, levels of food sovereignty for their own family. Um, I really like the kind of collective management model where the whole space is not individual plots, but everyone comes together to design and manage the space collectively. And I see it as a way to support the whole ecology of the farm or the garden. Um, and thinking about the space as a whole ecosystem in itself. Um, and there's, there's benefits to 
to that model. Um, when you're kind of managing your own plot by yourself, um, you know, if you have to travel or if you're busy, you know, you'll have to ask someone else to maybe help, but oftentimes they kind of get neglected or abandoned. Um, maybe your growing technique or your you know, in a more exposed area, and so your tomatoes didn't grow as well. Um, and so, you know, maybe that feels like an individual burden. Um, on the other hand, when we're managing um, kind of the food production collectively, those responsibility can be shared across the community. And so, you know, if you're not able to come in and take care of um, things, like other people are there to take care of things. And if, you know, one section of the farm doesn't produce very well or some of the vegetables die, um, that's not like your individual responsibility. That's like a collective responsibility. Um, and so there's, m there's more of a shared kind of burden of responsibility across the community in the kind of collective management model. Um, and that's something that we practice at the Buena Vista Community Garden. Some people do want their individual plots because they want to be able to do their own thing, but we're really inviting people to let us know like what they want to grow and what they want to do, and we can make space for them around the farm to do that. And, uh, you know, they can kind of take charge of uh, a little area or, you know, we can plant some stuff here, plant some stuff there. And so we s we're practicing more of an integrative approach um, to everyone having some creative autonomy and what they want to grow and how they want to manage it um, within the principles of the greater ecology of the garden. So, it's kind of a way to have a holistic uh, approach to garden management. And everyone at the Buena Vista model that we'll see tomorrow afternoon, everyone gets to share in the harvest. Um, we kind of set it up as very much an accessible space. It's very much non-commercial. And people can come and go as they please. They can take they can harvest vegetables as they please. Uh, so everything's kind of freely given out um, to the community. So some of the principles that we're working with, I already talked about biodiversity a lot, uh, wildlife habitat, supporting that. Um, also utilizing techniques such as cover cropping, um, which is uh, using legumes um, such as beans or peas or oats, vetch, rye, things like that, that help to uh, fix nitrogen or put nitrogen in the soil and uh, produce nitrogen in the plant matter. So it helps to kind of add that nitrogen fertility to the soil. Practice such as intercropping is uh, basically, or companion planting is basically putting like different types of plants together, cultivating biodiversity once again. Um, so avoiding, you know, planting out one whole section as, um, you know, just beans or something or just tomatoes and making sure we plant like flowers and herbs um, in between those as well and that helps to cultivate that biodiversity um, sometimes you know if you have a whole bed of like one vegetable can get attacked by a pest aphids are really common um, and having some other kind of flowering or herbal plants around um, helps to mitigate that kind of pest damage Crop rotations is the idea that different plants take up different mineral profiles in the soil. And so some, some plants feed and extract more nitrogen or other nutrients from the soil. And so you want to give the soil a chance to kind of recover its fertility before you plant that heavy feeder again. And so it's good to plant it in different places. Also helps with disease, like tomatoes can be susceptible to verticillium wilt, which is like a wilt of the leaves. And so it's good to put them in different places every year so they don't get susceptible to that same disease um, each year. Native plants are really great to um, integrate into your garden. And part of that is kind of restoring the kind of cultural um, plants that were part of uh, this place, but also it's about kind of being conserving water and resources and having plants that are adapted to the climate that's here and that also support um, the native wildlife here. And so a lot of the native pollinators, for example, um, 
make use of native plants for their habitat reproduction and feeding. And it's more difficult for them to utilize other types of plants because they're not evolved in that way. And so kind of integrating diverse native plants supports native pollinators, supports biodiversity, supports water conservation uh, as well. Um, integrating fruit trees and if you can, livestock um, is really great. You know, the more diverse kind of agricultural systems are uh, kind of the best for soil health and ecological well-being. And so the more kind of diversity you can integrate, um, the better. So if you can, to put in trees and livestock, um, also really great. Um, thinking about accessibility, like how people are going to move around in the space, and if you have people that might have special needs in your community, if there are people in wheelchairs, um, thinking about wheelchair accessible pathways or like elevated garden beds um, to support them. Um, thinking about language, you know, if you have many kind of uh, multilingual people in your community, um, having people be able, like bilingual people on your team to be able to communicate them is really helpful. So our garden is doing a lot of things. It's providing a lot of functions and not just food production and soil health, but also community well-being, gathering space, also education, habitat restoration, um, potentially natural building as well. If you have a good amount of clay in your soil, then you can utilize the soil on site um, to do like natural earth building um, and do natural structures. So I kind of listed out all of the different design elements you might want to think about. Um, we've already kind of covered a lot of these things. Uh, some of the new ones, so we have our soil building techniques, so your garden beds themselves, your compost area. So these are the things that you want to think about placing. Like where are you going to put these things? Where are you going to put your vegetable beds? Where are you going to put your fruit trees? Um, where are you going to put your native plants? They're going to have different kind of soil needs and you may be uh, utilizing different soil building techniques for each of those areas. Um, your compost should probably be near the road or where people can drop off food scraps really easily. Um, you, you don't want to be like wheel bearing stuff from the road all the way to the back all the time. That creates a lot of labor um, for transportation. So it's more helpful to keep the compost kind of in the front where uh, front near the road. Um, thinking about your plant ecosystems, your soil ecosystems, um, having a nursery maybe is helpful. If you can start your own seeds, um, produce your own seedlings, um, that supports kind of the productivity of your farm overall. Um, if you want livestock, thinking about where you want to put those things, what type of kind of structures they might need. If you have, if you want to have bees, where do you want to put those guys? So just kind of a laundry list of the different elements that you might want to place on your garden map. Um, if you're on a slope, you might want to think about your water management. Even if you're in a flat area, you might want to think about having a pond. Oftentimes critters like squirrels or insects or I don't know, maybe possums can chew up your irrigation lines because they're looking for water, especially if it's dry. And so creating a pond structure um, helps those guys like get water from the pond instead of chewing up your irrigation. It also provides water for bees and pollinators um, and other critters that are around. Um, so it helps to support the biodiversity of the space as well. Um, if you're on a slope, uh, you may want to build in some like swales or infiltration basins. These are like trenches or um, kind of like you know, you can make it any shape you want. It could be circular. We dug out a heart-shaped pond at Buena Vista. Um, so that is to, if you're on a slope, maybe I'll draw this out. But yeah, so you guys probably have heard about a swale, but I'll just talk about it a little bit. So if you have a slope, then your water is going to be running downhill and, you know, bringing soil down with it. So contributing to erosion um, and you might be forming like what we call like erosion gullies or channels. So you might see like, you know, rivets in the soil and that's where the water is going down and contributing to erosion. And so to kind of mitigate that effect, um, we would want to put in a swale, which is like digging a trench essentially. And uh, you would put, a berm um, on the 
downslope side so that when the water is going down here, it'll get caught in this swale, it'll get infiltrated into the soil, and so and then it will be stopped by this berm as well. So that prevents the water from going further down and causing more erosion. Um, so you could dig out the soil to make this berm, and you can fill swales with like gravel or wood chips or logs and you can also make this more fancy like a hugel structure which is like a mound that of like logs and branches and wood chips and other organic matter and soil so it's another kind of like soil building technique or garden uh, mound technique um, but basically this allows you to infiltrate your water in the soil keep it in the soil instead of contributing to erosion downslope um, the infiltration basin is generally at the lowest spot of uh, a property. So let's say this is like kind of the end of that slope. You might want to put like an infiltration basin here. It could be mounted up on both sides, but more likely the downslope side. Um, and it's the same kind of concept that uh, water infiltrates there. And you can grow like riparian or water kind of loving plants around there. Um, although out here, it, like it doesn't rain that much. So it's like not necessarily going to get that wet, but um, it helps to uh, prevent erosion in general. Water management or earthworks. Uh, we also have gathering areas and processing areas. So gathering areas where people can hang out, um, some chairs and tables or logs that people can sit on um, in a shady area is helpful. Processing areas, if you're gonna be you know, doing a, a lot of harvesting and food distribution, you may want like a sink, um, counter space, or like shelves, um, crates, things like that to help wash and process all of those uh, veggies. So making space for that. You probably want a tool shed. Uh, you might want like a, a toilet structure, like a compost toilet structure. Um, Maybe an herb drying shed or just like a little hangout space um, would also be cool as a structure. Um, also want to think about your power and water sources. Um, so you'll definitely need water, like a main uh, water line somewhere through your garden. Um, if you can get power there, uh, that may be helpful if you want to do like events or presentations or something like that in your space. Um, otherwise, it's like not absolutely necessary, um, but it would be nice to have power. Toilet hand washing station or in a, a way for people to wash their hands. It's helpful. So I like to think about how we go about the design process. Like we know about our principles, we know about the different elements we might want to put in there. So how do we go about deciding where to put them and what kind of goals and functions to prioritize? Usually when you go, like oftentimes in my experience in these community meetings, when we ask community members, oh, what do you want to have at the garden? You know, they'll list like every single thing on the list. And, you know, if we can do that, like that, that's amazing. Um, but we want to, if we don't have the space to do that, then we want to prioritize a little bit. What are the greatest kind of needs of the community that this garden can serve? Um, and how kind of do we meet those needs uh, through the design elements. So if the priority uh, for, th for the community is to have gathering space, then we wanna carve out more space for that. And that's gonna take away from, you know, things like intensive food production or more composting. It's like, uh, yeah, if you come into a space, like in a one acre lot or something, yeah, like you could turn the whole thing into a giant compost site. Um, but usually community members want like all of these diverse features. And so we want to make space for um, as many elements as we can um, that serves kind of the priorities and needs and values of the community. Um, so we start with the community input. 
Uh, I like to think about like bioregional needs, like are there other large farms nearby? Is there a large orchard nearby in the region? Is there um, a large compost facility in the region? So like if there's already an existing kind of resource for that, like maybe we don't have to emphasize that quite as much and we can emphasize something different that the community has also has great need of that there isn't already present in the community. The existing energy flows, so if there's existing trees where the sun and shade patterns um, are happening on that site already, what the wind pattern is like um, already there. Um, it's always good to do a soil test coming into a new space, so looking at what your starting soil is like and what it might need in terms of amendments or remediation. Thinking about symbiotic elements that can be mutually beneficial if you kind of implement them together. <clears throat> Thinking about the access and transportation, walkways, like, you know, if you want a truck to be able to drive all the way down a property, um, that's a lot of, like, road space for that vehicle. Um, and that would take away from other design elements you might want to put in there. So if you just have space for the truck to drive in um, 50 feet, and then the rest of it is just like wheelbarrow and walkway, like just people walking. Um, then you have more space for like garden beds or fruit trees or things like that. Permaculture kind of teaches about zones, uh, which is like, you know, if you're doing home scale design, um, the things that you're going to access most in your everyday life, you want to be close to your home. So you have your like kitchen herbs, your home compost right near the house. And then further out, you know, you have fruit trees because you harvest them less frequently, less of a daily activity, maybe more seasonal. Um, so it's kind of uh, distinguishing the frequency of access to how far away it is um, from like your kind of core operating center. So that might be something to think about. It's kind of like the kind of compost process of like, you know, putting your compost near the road because that's where it's most accessible to the people in the community who are dropping off uh, feedstocks. Thinking about your wildlife needs, um, designing for that designing for restoration, and also thinking about kind of long-term evolution and succession. So a lot of the times we don't ha get to keep our space for like super long-term, like, like, oh, we only have this opportunity to do like a one-year like land use agreement to demonstrate this garden project. Um, but in reality, if we're thinking about the garden as an ecology that matures over time, uh, we you know, it comes together and grows and matures and it's better to have the space for like five years or 10 years because then the garden ecology and the community itself can really have a chance to grow and mature and come together and be more in self-regulation um, like the mature ecosystems, like a forest ecosystem, so that it can be more self-regulating and take care of itself and its ecological functions better. and you know, gives a chance to restore more ecological functions over time. Um, so, you know, even though like oftentimes we don't have access to spaces for the long term, I like to try to think about planning for that and designing for that anyway, just as a practice, like, and maybe like splitting it up into kind of parts like, okay, this is our kind of short term, we're gonna have vegetables grow in like a couple months, but we also want to have an orchard and we don't even know if we're gonna have this space uh, in five years, but we're just gonna plant these trees anyway and hope that we can kind of advocate for more time here and build up the ecology around the orchard um, over that time. So some of the first things uh, we think about when we come in into a new site, such as a vacant lot, um, is like where the water is flowing, whether we need earthworks, erosion mitigation strategies. It's always good to do a soil test, test for heavy metals, especially in urban areas. See what the kind of existing uh, texture and organic matter is like. Um, and it's kind of nice when you do your soil building processes after a year to see um, what the changes are in that soil quality. So hopefully we'll get to do some pre-test, post-test post -test soil testing uh, with some of your sites. Uh, if there's any grading, it depends on if you're on a really hilly 
area, you might need to do some grading or terracing to flatten areas out to make them more like hospitable to food production. Um, and then generally the water infrastructure is something that always needs to be um, installed in the beginning. So these are some uh, of the site modifications you may need to do initially at your site. So I talked a little bit about swales and infiltration basins for water conservation and earthworks. Um, there's also like for home scale, like the rain barrel is really good at capturing water from the gutter. And so you can use that for irrigation and stuff. Um, I guess I like to kind of try to capture water in the soil. I feel like it helps to support the uh, biology and also supports like groundwater recharge. Uh, a French drain is just kind of a chant, like a little trench channel filled with gravel essentially. Um, it is utilized to divert water away from areas like where you don't want them to collect. So oftentimes used for like housing foundations where you want to kind of drain water away from the foundation of the house. You can use the French drain um, and channel that water elsewhere. Um, so if you have like a more complex site with more topography, you may want to be using like a French drain or another infiltration channel to channel water into a swale or an infiltration basin talked about soil testing. Locally here, we send a lot of our initial soil tests to Wallace Labs, which is in El Segundo. Um, that's like south of LAX. So a lot of you out in this area could send your samples to Wallace Labs. They're really fast. Uh, they'll give you your report uh, within a few days, generally. I feel like I get my reports within a few days, generally, of sending them in. Definitely within the week of sending them in, you'll get your report back. There's also a lab called Waypoint Analytical in uh, Anaheim um, that also is great for soil testing, but they don't necessarily specialize in like heavy metals um, or anything like that. But they do have really great uh, assessments for organic matter and cation exchange capacity, um, so that's really useful. I always uh, try to advocate for biological testing too, because I always want to see what the microbial community composition, how that compares to the chemical profile and the other indicators. So earth fort is still the most like commercially accessible kind of biological testing lab based on Elaine Ingham's method of microscopic kind of quantification and identification of these different organisms. Uh, so that's based in Oregon. Um, so we send our samples up there for biological testing and it'll give you your total and active bacteria, fungi, um, your protozoa based on your amoeba, flagellates, and ciliates, approximate kind of estimate of the population. Um, nematodes will identify by like feeding group or genus. Um, so you can actually do some analyses on the nematodes um, for their like maturity index, for the ecological maturity index. <clears throat> so try to do both. It gets expensive because the earth fort test is like $167 plus shipping. Wallace Labs is not as bad. It's like $85 plus shipping. But if you want the organic matter, then you have to pay another $55 to get that analysis. So it ends up being like $140 for the Wallace Labs test plus shipping. So altogether, it's like at least $300 um, to do um, both the biological and chemical testing. Um, and we are hoping to, we are trying to kind of um, budget some money from the CalRecycle grant to be able to do both biological and chemical testing uh, for some of your sites. So hopefully we'll get to do that for you guys and then compare all of the data. So I uh, just want to share a little bit about the Buena Vista community garden design process. And we did a couple community meetings and did some canvassing and outreach uh, using all of those techniques. We flyered at different events to get people to come to a community meeting. And we asked them questions like, what do you want to see in this space? What do you want to do in this space? How do you want to feel when you're here? Uh, and we gathered our long lists of things that people want to see in that space. And we came together as a group uh, to Well, we did try to invite the community again to our actual design meetings, um, but, you know, we were activating a new space. We were kind of reaching out to new people, so they didn't really show up to the actual design.
design meetings. Um, so it was just kind of the organizing team that was like taking all of the information that the community had shared and trying to integrate it into a design. And this is the first kind of concept that we had come up with. And you know, a design is like a guideline, especially for kind of a more grassroots volunteer run project um, where you know we didn't get to build out everything we wanted. Um, it's not fully like built out completely, um, but things and things change as uh, we work the site and decide to make different choices. But this was one of the first concepts that came out of that process. Um, so I think it's good to be flexible with your design. Um, it's good to stick with it and also understand that you may, you know, think about things or things may come up as you're working the space that you didn't think about before or you're walking through and feeling the space and feeling like, oh, this, you know, it would be better to move things around in this way because it would be more efficient or more comfortable or more inviting to, to make it that way. But just to showcase um, what the original kind of concept came out to be. So... This is like the sidewalk, and we were going to do some succulent plantings there. This is the road. There's a gate that comes in here where a vehicle could come in, and we decided to kind of make a walking pathway um, all the way down that kind of splits. People were really interested in doing gatherings, um, performance, um, things like that. So we talked about maybe keeping the center as a stage, having the pathway wind around it, and go back. In um, circles are fruit so we were thinking we could do a fruit trees along this side. Um, some of our intensive vegetable areas are these green bars over here, and our compost areas front you can see, and uh, we have some uh, feedstock storage areas. We thought we might put our pollinator hub here. We have a pond uh, in the design down here. We have our vegetable processing here. This is a tool shed over here. And we had some other ideas for maybe like a hugo culture, a little laundry gray water station. So you'll see tomorrow that there were some changes to this design as it was built out. The pathway is pretty much kind of like this. Um, we decided to put in more intensive vegetable production areas. Uh, kind of in this space and in this space. And we do have a heart-shaped pond back here. Um, we didn't get to put in all these fruit trees, but hopefully with the Calor Cycle Grant, we'll get to put in a, maybe like 20 or so new fruit trees. So we have a few. And so there's some kind of food foresty patches in this section. And we decided to change this section to more intensive vegetable production um, because I think that was important to um, have food production and food access. The area did get to stay up here. All right, so in your kind of design, it helps to think first the plants, as I mentioned, and uh, their soil, water, sun needs, and kind of grouping them based on that. Um, and then thinking about where water is flowing on your site, what the existing soil is like, and how you can utilize um, some of those existing features. Um, so you don't have to do more work to change all of those environmental conditions um, for those plants. So it's like if you, yeah, have uh, a more difficult soil or like you want to have your native plants um, put in somewhere, like you, it might be a place where there's not like a lot of water collecting or the soil is maybe like more clay uh, or something like that. Um, and you also want to think about, yeah, think about water flows. So where you want to design your water features based on what plants you want to grow. Native plants typically don't like too much organic matter. They don't need much water, although they they do need regular watering when they're getting established. And it's kind of hard to say because like I see native plants responding well to compost sometimes. Um, so sometimes the clay could be like, or the soil could be like new clay and some of them um, like a little bit more drainage. Uh, so it kind of depends on the native plant itself. Just 
any vegetables and fruit trees like a lot of organic matter, so it's good to put those in like composty areas. Um, if there's like water collecting in a certain area, it might be good to put like a tree, um, like a water loving tree is like a banana. Um, if there's like, if you have a gray water or like, um, if water happens to be collecting in an area, that might be a good spot for a banana tree. Um, also thinking about your sun shade requirements. So full, you know, full sun areas, you want to put plants that really need that full sun. More shady areas are good for like uh, things like mint um, or herbs or things like that. So I've talked a little bit about planting concepts. Um, I guess the only thing I didn't touch on was plant guilds, which is more of like really thinking about not just like two or three plants together, but a whole like set of like four or five plants together that all interact with each other in like a mutually beneficial way. So it could be like one has a long tap root, one is like more shallow and like spread out. Um, they may pull up different mineral profiles. One may be a nitrogen fixer, uh, one may be a pollinator plant or like a nectar kind of provider. Um, so putting them together to kind of support each other um, that way. Uh, really thinking about climate adapted plants is something that we talk about a lot here in this region, especially because of drought. Um, so we're really thinking about plants that don't need a, like a ton of water to be supported and to grow well. So we think about um, plants that come from either here, like native to this area, or come from other areas that have a similar climate, such as Mediterranean climate. Um, so places like uh, South Africa or Australia, plants from those places could also do well out here. Um, some of the trees that are adapted to this climate are fig, pomegranate, sapote, guava, chermoya, mulberry, mesquite, palo verde, olive, and citrus. And there's other ones too, but those are some of the um, popular ones that are um, that we often plant uh, in our systems. Um, so we grow stone fruits out here as well. Um, I think they like to have a little bit more w water and they usually need some like chill hours in the winter so like sometimes like it doesn't get cold enough for long enough for them and so sometimes um i don't know they're upset about that but these guys are all very climate adapted and do really well out here so we can support um, pollinators um, by providing them with like habitat space. Um, there are like little bee hotels you can make, which are like holes drilled into like a wood box that native bees will like nest in. And you can see that they've nested in them because they're all stuffed up full of stuff. Uh, they also, their native bees also like to nest in the ground. So. Um, and also in brush piles. So kind of having a messy look is like good for wildlife actually. So if you have like some brush piles around, like that's okay. Um, it's good for bees. Um, and, it's, and if you wanna more intentionally create ground nesting space for them, um, you can kind of make little holes in the ground uh, for them. Um, hummingbirds and butterflies uh, are really drawn to lots of flowering plants. So I really like to think about planting diverse flowers around the space to kind of attract that diverse uh, pollinator life over. And they also can be medicinal um, or just like people sometimes really like flowers and are just like really attracted to them. So in terms of like being a inspiring and inviting space for the community, um, flowers can be really nice. Milkweed is something that uh, really attracts monarch butterflies. So you can plant milkweed and try and to that will help promote uh, monarchs. The native pollinator hub is really interesting because it's not just the nectar producing um, plants that they need to feed on, but there's also core hub plants uh, like trees, like oak and manzanita, and they actually do utilize the woody material and they can feed on the leaves as well. Um, so they utilize that material to um, help build habitat for them and help to reproduce. Um, and they also feed on, yeah, the woody and uh, leafy material as well. Um, buckwheat and ceanothus are native plants that really host, play host to um, reproduction. So they like mate on one plant and like lay their eggs on one pl on another plant. Uh, and then that caterpillar is like munching on the foliage there. 
And then outside of that, you can have your nectar producing plants like sages, woolly blue curls, red fairy duster, et cetera. And then that's what the butterfly will feed on um, during its lifetime. So setting up a pollinator hub is good to have um, all of these elements there, all of these different types of plants there to support all the different activities of native pollinators. Um, and we do have uh, this setup at the Buena Vista Garden. We have manzanita, buckwheat, ceanothus, and uh, sages and such. So we are trying to cultivate uh, native pollinator space. Thinking about your irrigation systems, uh, hand watering can get really time consuming. So um, generally our vegetable beds are set on a drip system. It helps to reduce water use and goes directly into the soil. Um, sometimes sprinklers are really helpful to cover a large area if, this, if that's what you need. Micro sprinklers um, can cover some area while like not using a ton of water. Sometimes people like to use rotational sprinklers and it's also to cover like a large area. Uh, and timers are like my favorite thing because then the watering gets done automatically for you if you just set the schedule on a timer. Um, and there's also like more smart timer systems. Um, if you hook up all of your valves um, electronically to um, an irrigation timer, you can set the different zones and set different schedules for each of those zones, which is really great if you have like, you know, you can separate out your like native plants from your fruit trees, from your vegetables, and you can even put irrigation on your compost piles as well to keep them moist. So some of the more common soil building techniques, uh, we are spreading mulch everywhere, wood chips, um, and that helps to retain water, mitigate erosion, um, build uh, organic matter. And when we're building our vegetable beds, um, lasagna mulching is a really great method. Um, so we have our wood chips at the bottom and layering on manure, potentially more wood chips, and compost on top to kind of build our vegetable beds. And you can plant in it right away. It might be a little bit variable in the first year, but as it kind of decomposes and the soil builds over time, um, it gets to be really nice in the following years. I mentioned hugel culture, and that's like a mound garden technique. Um, it's supposed to be conserving water and absorbing moisture from the air. There's big logs inside uh, that are buried inside and there's like capillaries running through the log that are supposed to kind of help absorb and store water inside that structure. Um, and it's also, you know, you pile on like branches and twigs, um, wood chips, soil, and things like that. And then you can grow native plants. You can also do vegetable production on these mounds. Um, so some people are really big fans of hugel culture. Um, I, you know, have helped to build a few of them, um, but I'm still learning about them and exactly how they work. So obviously composting, uh, we, and I'm a fan of like till farming systems, and so we typically are amending our soil with compost um, and not like turning it in <coughs> or tilling it in at all. So we just kind of layer it on top and water it in, and that's it. Um, if you do a soil test and you see, you know, what you often see is that compost is not super high in nitrogen. And so it helps to add a little bit of nitrogen fertility. Worm compost is a really great source of nitrogen. Um, there's also feather meal and blood meal that are good sources of organic nitrogen. Um, so those are good kind of supplements to add to your pile of compost. Bone meal is more kind of phosphorus oriented. Um, in my experience, the composts that we've made are pretty high in phosphorus, so we don't necessarily need um, a ton of phosphorus amendment. Uh, you may be interested in kelp meal or rock dust. Those provide uh, a wide array of micronutrients, um, which plant plants really respond very well to. So kind of a combo the, for the amendments to the compost that you're going to put on the soil. I generally like to do like a nitrogen and then like a like a trace minerals kind of thing. So it's either like vermicompost, uh, feather meal or blood meal, plus like rock dust or kelp meal. Like those are good sources for kind of trace minerals. So in, in terms of soil building techniques, you know, you want to map out like, oh, I'm doing my native plant garden here, so I just need some 
I don't know, some mul mulch, but I don't know, maybe my clay, my soil is way too clay and needs more drainage, and so maybe I'll add some compost. So you might want to play around with that a little bit. Um, and then in your like vegetable areas, you're like, okay, I'm gonna build up a lot of organic matter, do the whole like wood chip manure compost situation and really build up the organic matter layer uh, versus like fruit trees, maybe. I mean, you could do the same thing essentially um, uh, to build up soil for trees. So thinking about different areas and what they need in terms of their soil and then like uh, kind of I mean, uh, it's 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 good to like just spread wood chips everywhere. That's very common practice in a lot of projects I've worked on. Um, you know, it's good for gathering sp areas, a good base for compost. So it's good to it's good general practice. Um, talked a little bit about the mulching method for garden beds. You could also do raised vegetable beds. I guess I tend to be biased towards less infrastructure. So the less infrastructure you can do the better um, raised beds, um, I don't know. I feel like they're maybe a little bit limiting, but some people really like them. It might be good if you have to bring in soil, if the soil underneath is maybe a little bit contaminated. Um, but I feel like, uh, you know, if you want to move things around, you want to change your bed shape, um, it's easy to just work with like mounds of organic matter, essentially. The keyhole design is, um, supposed to be like, um, I'll draw it. So it's supposed to maximize the amount of growing space compared to the walkway. So typically you have a walkway that goes into the garden bed and then there's like kind of a circle where you can like walk around and then the garden bed is like all around. And the idea is you can walk in and then you can access all of the space around it. So you don't have to, so it's the idea is supposed to maximize your growing space to walkway kind of ratio. Sometimes I'm not really sure. Somebody should do the math on that really. <laughs> For compared to like, uh, r like intensive cultivation rows. You might want to demonstrate container gardening for people who live in small spaces. Um, there's also a, a technique called garden socks that some people are really into, and it's like kind of a, a plastic mesh that you put like soil blends in, and then you cut a hole to plant your seedling in there. Um, some people really love that method. Uh, I think it's kind of cool. Like, um, there's a project I work with that does vertical gardens with garden socks and so they have like a shelf basically and they put like garden socks like on four or five shelves so for people who are space limited it's kind of a cool concept you can still have a soil based growing system that's a, a vertical garden system and it also works with kind of water recycling or sort of like hydroponic -y kind of water recycling system. So it's soil, soil based, but you can like put it, elevate it on like a little pipe and then have water coming through the bottom. And there's a project I work with that kind of recycles that water, has a pump that recycles that water through and through. Um, so again, I try to be like less infrastructure oriented, but some some people are really excited by like packaged uh, kind of ideas for gardening that uh, make it seem more like simple. Um, but yeah, you have to like stuff the soil in the sock and then you have to replace it like every couple years. So it could be kind of tedious. Um, the vegetable beds we have at Buena Vista are four foot wide with uh, one foot pathways. Um, so yeah, they're layered with mulch, manure, and compost on top. We use drip tape. Other ideas people have talked about, like for conserving water, is to like dig dig the bed in and do a sunken bed, and also or like dig a groove for the drip tape. I'm not sure how well. I I mean we kind of tried that and it, it does kind of help, but um, it's really about the soil quality that helps to infiltrate the water more better kind of our laundry list of structures. Oh yeah, you might need fencing or a gate if you deal with a lot of vandalism, so some security could be helpful. Tool shed, put a lock on it. 
Um, you might want some benches, like cob benches are kind of cool, cool project to build. Um, picnic tables are really nice, so having seating areas is really helpful. Uh, I think I mentioned all of the other structures earlier, and so I wanted to just kind of summarize the benefits of this kind of integrated compost garden design approach. Uh, the biodiversity of the garden supports with minimizing pests and odors in your compost. You can use the compost on the farm. You can share organic materials of mulch and manure. And so, it, I mean, it kind of, like the farm kind of contributes to your diversion uh, statistics if you're diverting that mulch and manure from the landfill and applying it on site. Um, that's also diversion. Uh, I feel like there's more opportunity to do kind of creative composting, such as more integrated into the garden beds. As someone mentioned, like, burying the worm compost in a garden bed. Um, sometimes people bury the compost in the, s the center circle of the keyhole. Uh, you could do, I've done like trench uh, worm composting before. Um, so it's an opportunity to get creative uh, with, with all of these different concepts. Uh, the other nice thing about having this whole kind of compost garden design is that you can see how well your compost is doing by like how well your plants and vegetables are growing. So you get kind of immediate feedback on that. This is what the Buena Vista site looked like before. It was a vacant lot that the city owned. Um, Eleanor helped us initiate this project with a small grant and setting up the land use agreement with the city. Um, and this is what it looked like before. And these are some photos of what it looks like now. I'll just uh, introduce our participatory design project, and then maybe it will be lunchtime. Um, so Esperanza is near Buena Vista. Uh, it's a small site at a church with a multicultural congregation. And this is kind of the area that we have to use um, in our project in red. So it's about 200 by 50 feet adjacent to the street. And then there's another little bit of a section about 100 by 50 feet. And their goals are community connection, food production, and access, and nutrition. So those are some of the things that they were really interested in. It's funny because when you ask people what they want, usually they don't tell you about compost right away. But they want community, and they want food production. And so compost is a big part of that. And soil is a big part of that. So. People may not say like they want like healthy soil and healthy compost, but if they want healthy food and he healthy community, then it's a very foundational part of that. And so we can help to bring awareness to that um, by showing them like the importance of healthy soil and healthy compost in healthy food production and access. So some more photos of this site um, from the street. There's a big tree over there. This is uh, just, like coming a long strip on the back of the church. For our next section, we're going to start our group project. I'm going to have you guys get into groups of around six or so. So if you can start uh, organizing yourselves into groups of six, uh, we are going to start our community-led design by designing, planning, and designing your community design meeting. So some of the things you might want to think about uh, as you think about structuring your community design meeting, what are your goals for the meeting? What do you want to get out of it? What are the outcomes that you want to get out of that? Um, specifically, things that will help you in your garden design process. Um, but also, what do you want your community members to walk away with? What kind of feeling do you want to inspire in them? Uh, what kind of vision do you want to kind of co-create with them? So thinking about both sides uh, of the spectrum. How are you going to set up the space uh, so that it's inviting and facilitates positive interaction and connection so that it's easy for people to come through if you're going to have different activity stations so they know how to get there uh, and navigate their way through? What is your outreach plan to the community to invite people to your community design meeting? How are you going to structure the meeting? What's the sequence of events that you're going to do? 
What questions are you going to ask your community members? Are you going to create community agreements? What kinds of activities are you going to have? And how are you going to manage your contacts? And how are you going to keep in touch with the folks that show up to your space? And how long is your meeting? So maybe you want to think about the length of your meeting and what uh, kinds of questions or activities you can fit into that time frame. And if you want to try to schedule a series of these community meetings, think about uh, how you're going to do that. Uh, how you're going to maintain contact and do your outreach on what types of questions and topics you want to go over in these multiple design meetings. Uh, so I want you to kind of think about this um, from a practical perspective. So maybe you want to think about your project uh, from home and what kinds of resources and skills um, you have available to you, what's within your capacity um, if in your home community. Um, so, you know, it's easy for an exercise to think like, <clears throat> oh, I want to have all the, like, fanciest uh, installations at the garden. Um, and, you know, if you don't really have the resources or capacity to be able to make that happen, um, it's not necessarily that practical and maybe not necessarily that useful for you. Um, so I know we're working with an example site, um, but I think it will help for you to think about how to apply that to your home site. Uh, so go ahead and get into groups of about six or so um, and start uh, brainstorming and thinking about the structure of your community design meeting. And uh, we'll do that for a few minutes and then um, we'll kind of hear from each group a little bit about what they came up with and their process. Um, so uh, for our community design, we have a goal to incorporate more of people's um, intuitive visions for what they want to, to fulfill from the inside out in, the, in their experience in the garden and with, with our programs. So um, we, we have incorporated a circle um, into our discussion yes the circle <laughs> into our discussion um, in order to uh, be able to get more participation coming in uh, to the discussions um, asking what it is that they want to receive from the experience um, as well as expressing uh, what our overall uh, goals and community um, goals are together collectively um, we also described um, or broke it down into uh, the different engagements that we would have um, in terms of um, how to collaborate um, using more um, things like visual cues, um, playing charades and things to that nature, um, as well as um, audio signals and sounds. Um, we talked about making sure that we incorporate a time for uh, breakout sessions, so there will be a time for us to come together as a circle, um, as well as separate um, as well. For this particular design, uh, we were talking about families um, that would come together, so giving the families an opportunity to break out and think about what they want as a vision there, and then coming back together and sharing that and then uh, taking some time and space to intermingle and um, break up the families a little bit uh, within the community um, so that we don't just kind of like stay within our family. Um, so, and the way that that could look would be like maybe asking different age groups to kind of break out in that way as well. Um, that way we have different families being represented um, in different groups. Um, we also talked about um, different ways to make sure that um, 
the knowledge sharing is um, being done in different ways. Um, so, for example, um, having multiple speakers, um, making sure that we have some hands-on activity, um, making sure that we have some activity that is inquiry-driven, where maybe someone is demonstrating while someone else is, you know, while everyone else gets the chance to just ask questions. Um, but uh, definitely making sure that we're using a circle um, in our engagements with each other. That way everyone is visual, everyone um, has the same opportunity um, to express themselves um, because everyone is oriented in the same position to do so. Great, thank you. I appreciate uh, kind of the breakout into small groups and multiple speakers, um, keeping it dynamic and engaging. Uh, I really liked the kind of knowledge share aspect as well. Um, just gonna go over to this group over here. You guys wanna share your process? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna pass the microphone around. Okay. We're gonna okay. Okay. So we were coming at this um, in a sense of making it a priority, like Eleanor had spoke about, of sitting back and kind of observing the community that we're working with and like the community that we are trying to work with. Um, I know that personally where I am from, one of the biggest important things was to sit back and find the people in the community that are already doing the work that we're doing, maybe just not as organized or they don't have the desire to you know, become their own org or whatever. Um, and so intentionally seeking those communities out by engaging in them um, and so being able to like for instance one of the things was you know go volunteer for those spaces like go and spend time giving them your time and being able to build that trust with them um, so that you are able to collab and, and gain more insight um, and then creating a space so that other people can take up that space and so we talked a lot about having an organized uh, space as far as time goes. I feel like an hour and a half is a pretty good time to like, it requires somebody's time and attention. Um, anything after that kind of feels a little restless and more like a workshop or like a day workshop. Um, we talked about providing snacks and food because those always make everything better. Um, having somebody who kind of takes on the responsibility of time management. So like, you know, it's really stimulating to be with a bunch of people. And as we've noticed this week, it's like we start going off and we start popping off on all these different topics. And all of a sudden we're having this like amazing time, um, but we're not able to stay, uh, you know, on task. Um, so having somebody claim responsibility for that just to keep us being effective. And then um, we talked about similar to the breakout like that, but doing smaller working groups. So like, we have this overall mission and we've invited the community out and we're all sharing space, talking about ideas and what we want this to look like. And then we start noticing like little clusters are gonna naturally form. So like you guys are really passionate about this one area of topic or you guys are so like, you got, let's form a working group surrounding that and then those people can decide, you know, like we wanna meet once a week now, we wanna do this. Um, just so that it makes it more of an effective system. Um, and then, Oh, as far as communication goes, like beyond that, the follow-up communication is something that I personally am looking into learning more about because that's like where I fall short. Uh, but one of the things that we've seen is having one person who is willing to do that follow-up communication of like, hey, four days after the meeting, like, hey guys, you guys all signed up for this. This is what we spoke about. Like what I heard you guys say was you were willing to give one hour a week to this or whatever like has everybody still feel good about that and if so like can proceeding with future like meeting plans after that um and then for activities oh yeah <laughs> so for activities um you know depending on how consistent people are i think it's really important to always have icebreakers or some type of play i think um, these meetings can sometimes get really cut and dry and really intense so you have to kind of like break that up with movement or you know some type of breath work or I've been to meetings where they've offered play-doh and pipe cleaners because there are times where you know you can process information when you're able to do something with your hands so just offering different uh, modalities for people to engage with so they're not feeling stuck and still and um, yeah that was it for the activities. Yeah, that's it. 
Thank you. Yeah, I like the working groups idea. That sounds uh, like really great. Um, and I appreciate the hands-on activities. I think that's something that's good to keep in mind that people have different kind of ways to process information. So thank you guys. Test, test, check, check, one, two. Is that all right? <laughs> so uh, we we got into quite a few discussions. We talked about our own personal experiences with first-time community meetings. Um, I've been in a few first-time community meetings, and they, uh, they can be challenging. So one of the things that we talked about was, first off, evaluating uh, interest in the community garden space. So um, when you have your first meeting, there are going to be some people that are more interested than others, and it's definitely important to um, take note of the people that that are interested that are very passionate about that because those are the people that um, are more likely to stay additionally the people that uh, are maybe less inspired an important thing like one of the goals should be to inspire people at the first meeting to like want to be there because if you want to be somewhere you're more likely to put in work um, we also talked about uh, for a goal to uh, get children involved because they are obviously the future um, and an important thing for the space uh, is to evaluate it because every space is different. So that's going to obviously change the way your community space is. Sometimes you get an empty lot that's just filled with a bunch of weeds. Or sometimes you might get an empty lot that was used to recycle old auto parts. So um, an important thing before you even have your first community meeting is to consider the space, whether you want to clean out the space before you have your community meeting. Or uh, if you want to get people involved in the actual nitty gritty, taking out all the stuff. You know, there might be barbed wire inside of the dirt, and you can bond with people in the first meeting, taking it out. It's actually pretty fun. Uh, do anybody else want to add anything? We also discussed uh, as a goal to uh, create microclimates because uh, some of the community members here are in like sort of arid regions like we have a palm desert region here and um, an important thing to consider for the community meeting is uh, ways to construct those climates yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was it you did it <laughs> thank you anybody else have anything else to say all right we good thank you yeah, when we were working on the Buena Vista space, we decided to clean it up before the meeting because we wanted to make a good impression. Uh, but it is good to do the nitty gritty work together as well. And if you can get people that are willing to do that, that's like a good sign that they're very dedicated and committed. So maybe it's good to start with that. Start with the dirty work together. <laughs> All right, how are you guys? Okay, so my group had a challenge. We had to kind of decide which type of format we wanted to take because um, my s I, I work at a school site and we're starting from scratch and some of the um, teammates are not starting from scratch. So they said, well, why don't we help you troubleshoot kind of what the beginning would look like? So um, we talked about a lot of the administrative s um, tasks that Lynn was talking about earlier are really taken care of by our school we have a volunteer coordinator. We have tutors from UCSD that volunteer on our campus. So um, we have uh, PTA meetings every month where we can engage like 200 parents. And so getting the word out, all of that I think is kind of the easy part. The hard part is establishing this plot of area at the school in terms of designing the space. Um, one of the challenges is also the aesthetic piece. Our admin wants to make sure that when anyone visits our campus, they leave wanting to donate more money. <laughs> so it always just has to look nice. So um, all that goes into um, the idea that anything we do at, at school, we want it to be student driven. So eventually once this is all established, um, the students will run this and it'll be their program. And I'm just the person that makes sure that they're all not you know, killing each other with the pitchforks or eating the worms because I teach sixth grade. So um, we talked about a meeting not being any longer than an hour. Our students can only really meet maybe before school or after school. Same thing with parents, they work, um, or maybe like a Saturday event. But um, coming up with our community agreements, um, goals for the meeting and including everybody involved in on those goals, 
um, identifying the needs of the community, the community being either the students themselves or the students and their families or everybody, right? Admin, students, parents, teachers even. We want to invite teachers to be able to use this space as a learning lab, right? Um, and so we talked about coming up with an orientation process where maybe students would lead other teachers in their classes through an orientation of the space. Um, and then at the end, we just kind of summarize like this meeting needs to be about the who, what, where, when, why, because we only really have maybe an hour at a time to meet. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not here for the group discussion, but I just copied the questions and I'm just trying to express what, I, what I'm thinking. Uh, for the first question, I think rather than just saying, okay, we are gonna have a meeting, come on in. Obviously, we are gonna do some sign-ups and we confirm how many people are coming. I think it will be a great idea if we can send them an agenda in advance so people who are coming to the meeting will have enough time to think and put them in writing no one is spontaneous right they cannot come up with maybe Einstein come up with eureka moments in his life but not everyone so sending that agenda like a, a day before or 48 hours before the meeting will really help people who need some time to process digest and put it into action and for the second question uh how will you set up the space i think when they ask me how will i set up the space yes we are in u.s we are well organized, whether it's on a farm or in a five-star hotel, that's obvious. But I think the main question is like, do you want to have a classroom set up, like everybody facing the person that way? Or do you want to have it in circles so that everybody can see everyone? I would highly recommend, I haven't done any research whether the circles are most effective ones when coming to discussions or if we need to lay out a design or something. So that that will be something we need to look into. Okay, having, like now, everybody's in circles. They are not in like one behind each other, but because we wanna discuss a thing, I want, and we wanna see how everybody is changing their expressions or how they are feeling about it. So having a space and trying to arrange those meetings in circle especially, I think will be a good idea for the first time or second time, depending on what kind of presentation it's going to be. Obviously, if somebody wanna draw something and present something, we need everybody's attention. But if it's an open discussion, circles. Uh, for how do you outreach, we already discussed all those points earlier. Flyers, knocking on the door, next door app, social media, we will get there. And uh, how will you structure the meeting? I think in this kind of meeting, who do you think the most stressful person of the meeting the organizer and i think the organizer should have good enough time before the meeting to prepare themselves or calm down themselves just to talk to the crowd because those are the people who are going to address the crowd initially and later on we all are going to pitch in and express our views and we are going to put a lot of information but the person who is opening the ceremony or the meeting needs a lot of help or uh, you know support from the rest of the team so that they can address the people you know if i went to a meeting and the organizer is like, where is my pen where is my water where is my book i'm like sorry i'm out of here you're not even organized to organize a meeting that's what how i feel personally and everybody you know most of the i don't know how many people will think that but there will be people out like that and so what i'm saying is let the leader to speak we are not politicians we are we are leaders so obviously everybody is going to be a leader because we are strengthening ourselves individually and as a team so let that fir first person in my case it's Haley. she's the one who introduced me to everything right now what i'm learning so i don't know how much i should thank her in person professionally and in front of crowds so I want to give her enough space before like 30 minutes before the session is going to start so that she can relax, maybe meditate or, you know, take a power nap so that you can come out and with full energy address the crowd. Um, what's the next question? I want to make sure we have time for everyone. 
to share. Oh, yeah, sure. So. I know there's a lot of questions on there. They're more like guidelines. Yeah. You don't have to answer every single one of them because we are just kind of crunched for time. But I appreciate you sharing. Oh, and you. if you want to jump in with the group, uh, feel free to do so. Um, so, yeah, thank you for, for sharing all of that. Um, Oh, that's great. Oh, Thank you. Those two people also got some ice. We have some <laughs> ice in the water, so feel free. Woohoo! Ice. Yay. Um, yeah, I really love the circle concept. Um, that's also something that we practiced at our community meeting um, and something that we practice in general, community circles, um, things like that. So that is a really great structure. All right, let's get to the next group. Uh, so we kind of just followed the the structure of the questions like how they were presented to us uh, but the first one was like well so what's the goals for our meeting for this garden so our we're kind of we're planning prior to like what questions we're asking ourselves like who are we gonna involve like why why are we inviting um, these certain people um, who's gonna be in charge of like conducting these surveys or assessing like who to invite. Um, so once like that's kind of out of the way, we kind of uh, tackle like a, like a neighborhood survey, like go ask around like why, like are you interested in a, like a community garden? Um, and if so, why? And if not, why? Uh, and then once we have the, the survey done, um, we just kind of figure like, okay, so if it's enough people, we can make a flyer. Um, and then, uh, once like the, that's set in place, how are we going to set it up? Um, so we're kind of following like, kind of like the blueprint that Maria had uh, presented to us, which is kind of like how Huerta de Valle came to be, uh, which was kind of just inviting people to your house and just sitting down and having dinner and then just talk about this garden that you're presenting to the community. And then um, once everybody's sitting down, just kind of ask, like, what would you like in your garden? Um, and then the structure for the meeting, uh, most importantly, like, you'd, you had, uh, we have, like, a designated role for at least three people. So we're going to have a designated speaker, a mediator, a timekeeper. That way, like, the meeting can flow smoothly. Um, and then firstly, like, we would have icebreakers. Um, Oh, like welcoming the people, introductions, uh, one sentence icebreakers, what's their purpose for coming to this meeting, um, and then why would they like to join this, uh, our endeavor for starting a community garden. Um, and then, si quieren decir algo, tienen más puntos que decir? Me gustaría oírlos a los de atrás. Do you want to say something or do you have anything to add? Oh, I, th I think that's it. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know there there has that, that point uh, that point in this case you know is uh, ev everybody there has a point that uh, that suggestion the ideas is that community garden and and I I put that 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 example and for uh, it started the nothing you know when I don't have nothing now and this is the the the, the goal. Yeah, because when when uh, I share with the, the guys, you know, I, I share the story for Huerta. I go and make a question around, and, and then a uh, little by little, I grow in with the, the suggestion ideas for the members in the community. And this is my, my uh, uh, idea, my su suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Dinner, food is always a great way to invite people, engage people, and start building relationships. So that was a great idea. So you guys already shared, right? Are you part of a group? Okay. Did you guys share? You pass it over? We started first uh, figuring out like our plan before the meeting. Uh, so like the recruitment part. So we were like, there has to be food. Um, and then we also said uh, we could give some giveaways, either like seeds or plants or gloves. Um, we thought that if there is a site, we should have the meeting at the site already, um, just so we can start envisioning of what it would look like together. 
Um, if not, then we can have it at a community room like nearby if we don't have access to the site yet or if there isn't a, a dedicated site yet. Um, and then when inviting people, um, we mentioned we could either do like canvassing or if you already have events like, uh, like food distributions or food giveaways, um, you can invite people then. Um, and then just invite people to come to a meeting and bring something for the potluck if they're able to. And if not, like still show up. Um, that way, it, like you let people know like that you're, you see them and like you're, you want them to contribute to. Um, and then for the meeting, um, we talked about doing intros um, on just like who they are, uh, what their experience in, is, is with gardening, uh, why they came today, and some expectations that they that they may have of like a garden or like what they what they think a garden is or um, what they would like to see, and then go over the agenda and timeline. Uh, so if we have a timeline that we want to get the project done by or like the things that we plan on talking to about that day. Um, and then go over and just do an overview of the site if there is one already. Um, so just the history of the site, like who owns it, what it used to be, who acquired it now. Um, and then if we're at the site to just do uh, some visioning. Um, so it's just some time to grab some food, uh, grab some pieces of paper, and then just start like walking around the site and making some drawings of things that you would like to see at the site um, that you would like for your family. Um, again, if, if access isn't available for the site, we would show different pictures of different gardens and have people write down things that they like about each garden. Um, so just point out like how do these gardens make you feel, what things make you feel that way, whether it's like community spaces or green spaces or the trees or like, and what things do they see on there that they would change. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then, so then at the end, uh, just have everyone come back and then just share either their designs that they had or things that they saw in the pictures that they really liked uh, from other gardens, just uh, to go around and, and share some things. Um, and then we ended it with the fan, right? The facts acknowledgement and next steps. Um, so we just wanted it to like bring everyone together at the end and shared like how many people came to the meeting. Um, and again, like the size of the space and all of the different things that everyone envisioned it could become. Um, acknowledging that it's important that everyone be there uh, so that the space really is community led and community used um, and so that they're a part of the creation process for themselves and for their family and then next steps uh, we said that we could either have like a, a design and planting event so Jackie mentioned that it's always great to have like an event where then the next time that people get together they get to plant um, and so we could either have a space for already start to planting or at one of the neighbors house to just like come together and start planting there um, and then finish and then like review the design um, in the next meeting like bring bring everyone's ideas that they had at this meeting and present a couple of designs and see if those fit what community members really wanted in the designs and so that's just continuing that design process of like is, does these work here are a couple of options what do you think and then just keep revising those until we get a good um, a good design anything else no? okay Cool. That's it. Thank you. I like the questions that you had asked. And uh, sometimes, yeah, you don't have access to the space. I remember when we did the uh, community meeting with Jorge del Valle at a new space in Harupa. Uh, we didn't have access to the space initially, and so we had to um, get a different meeting room that was right next to the site as our community meeting space. So that's also a possibility. Uh, you could share photos of the site um, if people aren't able to access it in the beginning. So thank you all so much for sharing. There was a lot of great uh, ideas and insight. And I'm going to lead us into the next process. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's always a good idea too to like have a mediator with um, like community discussions. I, I've had a lot of experiences like for example once in Huerta del Valle at the Rupa Valley site when like we were trying to discuss like future plans and a lot of things can get sidelined and kind of off topic and so I think it's always important to maybe have a mediator to help us stay on track with the discussions and just keep it positive or whatever needs to happen in that moment. Um, especially with larger groups who maybe the values and like ideas for the future aren't always the same. And so a mediator is always a good idea at community meetings. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I liked the uh, timekeeper suggestion also. Uh, when you when you have your meetings, I mean, t first time or any time, you should give reverence to the native lands. Uh, Dago is Kumeye, you know, Kumeye, and your ancestors, always. And put an altar in your place or something. All right, so I'll just share a little bit about how we did our community design meeting at the Buena Vista Garden. We did our welcome and intros. We talked about uh, how we had a little bit of funding and some of our ideas for the space just as an introduction. And then we did, uh, took a moment, kind of a quick meditation, uh, had everyone take a moment to breathe and reflect and to vision and imagine what they would like to see in the space. And we asked them about how they wanted to feel, what they imagined themselves doing, and then more specific concrete features uh, and then how they would like to connect with the community. Uh, in other sessions, we've asked people about, you know, what values they would like to see kind of expressed. Um, but yeah, you want to prioritize your questions. You know, you can generate long lists of things and uh, the discussion can go on for a while. So yeah, it's always good to have facilitation uh, to support with uh, keeping people on time. So the next step is to host your community design meeting. Um, so, I mean, you guys can take some time if you haven't completely, like, concretely laid out your kind of questions and uh, structure. Um, but maybe have, like, two people act as organizers um, and the rest of the group act as community members and play out your community design meeting according to the structure that you guys came up with. And then um, answer those questions that you came up with. Um, come up, you know, generate the list of things that the community members are interested in and asking for. Um, and then begin to synthesize and be just start thinking about the process of uh, what could be integrated at Esperanza. And that was a small site. It was about 100 or 200 feet by 50 feet. Um, and they were focused on uh, community connection, uh, food production, and food access. Um, so yeah, go ahead and start that process. I'll give you guys 20 minutes. I did not sign myself up for this. So. Hey. Does anyone else have a big fear of public speaking? <laughs> hey, I have like a cold sweat, but you would never know. Oh, you gotta stand up so that everybody can see you. <laughs> okay. Apparently we had a conversation about how to have a really good meeting. I was there. Um, so, we were talking about the power of story. And when you come into a room, especially a room full of people that may or may not know each other. And so what is the great unifier besides art and visuals? I, I think story is powerful. And I also believe that as leaders, transparency is, is an, it's a nice icebreaker when you can just say, hi, I'm vulnerable, and do it in a way that is connecting. So when talking about gardening, I think, you know, gardening or composting, Show up with your story. Know your story really well. You all sat around the campfire last night and told, told story, and I wish I was there. But I know the power of that. So if you bring your story into the room and invite others to maybe imagine it with you, you know, your grandmother's tomatoes, or did you all grow up composting? Do you remember what you ate? Do you remember what you threw away? Do you remember what you didn't waste? And get people going into that space with you. Um, and then from there, what we talked about was how do you extract value from the story? If you're going to have values-based communication, then how do you start highlighting that? So when people tell their story, we as leaders can learn to listen. So what is it that their story is communicating? What was important about that tomato or that compost pile? Well, to me, when I think about our compost pile as a kid, I think, like, well, it was kind of stinky, and I didn't really want to go anywhere near that. So right away, I can maybe connect with those, those people in my, in my group that might feel that same way. They might be a little afraid of it. I, I don't know your name, but I know, I know your story. <laughs> You're like, I don't want that compost pile there, you know? Get that away from here. So highlighting those values. And then we were talking about, well, what's the next step? How do you bring people into imagining how it could be? 
So we talked about visuals and having a visual of gardens. I think you spoke to that, Lynn, where you just have images. And then what, what speaks to your community about those images? Give them different design ideas. Um, and then taking from that the values that they're expressing and what they like. And Janet said, OK, so now we know what's important to people. Let's really like, let's, let's sit with it. Let's give space around it. For me, I talk fast. I try and slow myself down, and that creates an energy in the room. And I can even feel it right now. I'm nervous. I'm like, blah. So, so Janet was like, well, why don't we just take a deep breath and give some space to what we just talked about that was so important to you and invite people to take that space with you together. And in doing that, imagining the beautiful picture and at the same time, we can also say, so what's missing? What would you like to see here? And highlight the needs that are not yet being met. Is all of this making sense so far? Yeah. OK. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> it makes sense up here, and then I never know if it comes out right. OK. Um, and then after that, after sharing the beautiful picture together, we talked about an education piece. And the education piece brings people into well, why am I here? You know, this was a really fun thing that we just did together. And I got to imagine some really beautiful things. But what's going to make me come back? So how would you, you know, collectively bring people back? And I always think you've got to connect to the why. Like, why am I here? Why am I spending my precious life energy in this moment right here, right now, in this room with these people? And so if you can bring that out as a group and as a leader, to people's why and you really harvest that like you highlight it you name it you bring it into the room and you say and now we know and we're going to come back and talk about this again and we want to hear more because in a one and a half hour meeting or a two hour meeting like the stories are not done you've only just begun i think that's it did i get it all yep, okay did. okay thank you do you guys want to share about your process for experience? Hello. <clears throat> Hello again. Um, what was I? Okay, I'm listening. So we start the circle, um, giving reverence to native land and ancestors. Um, and then we have circle time. Circle time allows us all involved to understand those around them, uh, bullet points, what they want out of the meeting, what they want to give to the meeting, how they want their community to look like, what skills they have to give to the community and city. Uh, after we do that, we break up into groups specific to what folk have said that they want to provide to the community and or what roles they want to fulfill in said community. Uh, we have frequent movement breaks, um, we also give reverence to our ancestors and, and native land through um, breathing techniques, meditation, um, uh, alchemically charging the earth with your energy. Uh, and then after you do all of those things to, to get the information in which people want to do, especially after the breakouts, then you want to at least have an idea of infrastructure for the roles, community programs, and workshops, education that is geared towards the info from the circle. Or plan second meeting to start that. Um, what else? Mm, that's it. Okay. And also plan com community planting and outreach as part of the end of meeting bonding. Give them something to do. <clears throat> that's it. Oh, we also said that it could be incorporated into the other garden, Esperanza. <laughs> yeah. Mm. My bad. Thank you. I appreciate the integrative approach. Um, sorry if it was a little bit confusing, but the example site was the Esperanza site, and I know you guys haven't seen it yet. There's just this, like, very uh, maybe fuzzy Google Maps view of it. So, uh, and I kind of, maybe you were thinking about your home site and I did talk about drawing inspiration from there, but the example site was to, was to host it for Esperanza, but 
it's all good. We're just kind of practicing, walking through the concepts, um, so you guys get a feel for the process. Do you have the? Thanks. <laughs> okay, so we were a little confused, but finally, right at the end, we figured out what we were doing. Um, so we started the meeting by introducing ourselves as the facilitators and kind of kind of laying the framework for why we're all here, kind of giving an introduction to what um, a community garden is, just in case other like community members don't know what it is. Maybe they just heard about it, maybe they just saw a flyer, and they're like, what's this all about? So providing that introdu introduction. And then we got into introductions of the community members. So we asked them, um, what do you think, or what, what brought you to this space? Um, and what do you think a community garden is? And everyone, all the, in all the community members started to introduce themselves. That's about as far as we got. But um, from there, we were going to ask, um, what is your experience with gardening? Um, to figure out how they had personal connections to gardening. Kind of, I think after listening to uh, what Haley was talking about, storytelling, maybe connect that to um, community members telling their stories. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and what their needs are um, through story about um, gardening. And then, yeah, third, uh, what are your needs and wants out of a community garden and then oh yeah and then lastly uh mike had a really good idea of printing out maps of the community garden um or of the space <laughs> yeah so <laughs> printing maps of the of the space the esperanza space for everyone and having sort of a visioning session everyone having like uh crayons or pencils and um like envisioning what it would look like for them did i miss anything yeah and um asking like community members to put their contact information on their vision board so that we have an opportunity to contact them afterwards thank you guys um i like the uh crayon and drawing idea it's very creative and hands-on do you guys want to share a little bit about your process? <laughs> so um, what we did is we came uh, to the meeting, we introduced ourselves, and then we each of us wrote down our intentions of what we wanted for the garden. And then um, we did that separately so our intentions wouldn't influence what the other person would say. And then we read those out loud um, and we decided as a community to first plant a tree in the middle of Esperanza. So we took each of our intentions, we said them out loud, and we planted them um, along with a handful of compost that um, the community leaders brought to the meeting. And we set our intentions, we planted our intentions, and we planted the tree in order to first establish a sense of community in our garden. Um, we also, uh, for our next meeting, we decided to establish for the next meeting for something for everyone to look forward to is to bring um, food scraps. So then we can start a, our own compost pile. So there was another component to look forward to to the next meeting. And we gave everybody an opportunity to talk and express what they really wanted for the garden and how we were going to come together as a community. Did I miss anything? Okay, good. All right, man. Our community is now one. <laughs> awesome, thank you. I love that practice of burying the intentions with a tree. It's really fun. I one time had, at one of us had an event where people wrote down their intentions on paper and stuck them in little seed balls and we planted them around the garden. So that was also really cute. So I, I really enjoy those types of activities. <laughs> Uh, all right, next group. <laughs> 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 
Okay, we just had um, a mock meeting. We had introductions and um, everyone introduced himself and I asked what do they want out of the garden and um, they shared what they wanted. Uh, we want trees on the north side and um, Chris is going to do the drip lines and um, uh, we had a raffle and everybody won a pair of gloves <laughs> and um, uh, we talked about uh, our funding fundings and uh, this is a map for our site right here for the Esperanza site okay and oops and this is our co-leader right here you're next <laughs> so like she said we did inter introductions and everybody kind of shared their story what they were and we asked them how, what they wanted they told us what they wanted um they all agreed on there has to be a meeting space for everybody okay um I had great garden experience with my grandpa when I was a kid, and our kids are in apartments, and we we would like to garden with our kids. So we want a vegetable garden, and uh, I'm I'm willing to work on that with someone, and I'm willing to go look at some other gardens and see about a stage. So we have a place for the kids to do some things and make some you know theater or presentation. So I'm really interested in this. And I'm willing to do it because my family needs this. I don't like to get into too much details, but I need to get as many carrots as I can as quickly as possible. <laughs> that was his goal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just wanted to see a place where I can dance in my community and eat lots of fruit, uh, so a stage and fruit. And I just know a thing or two about drip tubes, so, yeah. <laughs> and that was our meeting. Thank you. Oh, the next step. Oh, okay. Our next step is gonna we're gonna um, design the garden, and we're gonna create a group chat to make sure we're all in agreement how we want the garden to look, and we, so we don't lose the. The interest of our community, we're going to start planning as soon as we can. And we're going to do, like I said, we're going to do follow-up chats. We're going to have a person follow up at everything that we, issues that arise. And like I said, we're going to start planning as soon as we can as, after we get our design completed. Great job, guys. So you're going to have a little family garden, a little carrot farm, and a little dance area, <laughs> dance club at the garden. And a text group. <laughs> yes. Thank you, guys. Uh, you guys want to share about your design process or meeting process? Uh, so ours was just kind of a like a general meeting. Um, we didn't really take much into account about Esperanza, which was kind of our mistake. Uh, but essentially, like we wanted to be mindful of like who our like community leader would be, so we uh, chose like Andres as our community leader, like so somebody that like the community would be familiar with, and they would like listen attentively because they respect that person. And then our mediator was Nicolas, and then I was the timekeeper. Uh, and basically, we just jumped straight to the topic of the day, uh, which would have been like, oh, where's our compost um, area going to be in the garden? Uh, but as the meeting went on, like, there's still, like, concerns that some people would have, uh, so somebody would ask, like, what about, um, like, how do we know our food's going to be healthy, um, and that's obviously an issue that we would want to address, but right now we're trying to stay on topics, so or a mediator kind of, uh, steered the conversation back to, like, the composting stuff, and then we, uh, discussed the logistics of it. Um, how are we going to get the food waste to the site? Um, like, how are we going to get volunteers and all that? Uh, and then once all that discussion's done, we went back to the concerns that the people had, and like we kind of tried to answer as honestly as we could, um, and also encouraging uh, community involvement. That way, they can see like the process from beginning to end, and they can monitor how their food comes out and ensure that it comes out healthy. And that's pretty much it.
Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate the thoughtfulness around uh, choosing the community leader. Uh, I think that's uh, really important to think about. So great job. Great job, everyone. Sorry, this is like a ton of work that I packed uh, into like 20 minutes. So thank you for uh, going along with this practice.